As you look at your Bibles in this passage of Scripture, you think, okay, this is the story of Jesus raising from the, someone from the dead. It's the culmination, really, of John's kind of outline, the seventh miracle recorded, seven being, you know, the number of perfection in the Bible. Um, really the final miracle before Jesus himself is crucified and, and rises from the dead that John wants to record so that we will understand about how to live for Jesus. Um, but this isn't the first uh, bringing somebody back to life that the Gospels record. If you go to the other Gospels, the, the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, um, there are actually a couple other places where Jesus raised someone from the dead. In Luke chapter 7, there was a widow's son that Jesus brought back to life. He kind of interrupted them as they, were, as they were traveling to the cemetery to bury him and raised this, this young man back to life in a, in a rather unusual way. Uh, later on in Matthew chapter 9 and Mark chapter, nine, or chapter 5 and in Luke chapter 8, we have the record of Jairus' daughter being raised back to life. And this again was a situation that all three of the other gospel accounts recorded for us where Jesus went in and he used a lot of the same language in that encounter with people calling her being asleep and people laughed at him if you record the story, remember the story. And he went in and, and brought her back to life. So in, in Lazarus' account here, we are specifically supposed to be learning about having life in his name. That's the, that's the lesson plan for today. And as we look at that lesson plan, let me direct your attention to what I believe are three main divisions in this. It's in your outline in the bulletin, but that has to do with delays and demands and deliverance because there is no crisis that doesn't involve those things in our lives from time to time. I know I've experienced them and I know you've experienced them. And so let's look at what's going on here and, and see how we might begin to apply this to our everyday life, all right? It begins in verses 1 through 16 with the delays in the crisis, all right, in the midst of the crisis. Verses 1 through 4 give us the news. It introduces us the main characters, Lazarus, a friend of Jesus, right? Lazarus, who is also related to Mary and Martha. Uh, and he talks about the city or the village of Bethany being just a little ways away from Jerusalem, two miles, okay? A short walk, really, um, by those standards at least. And it's interesting as he describes it in the first few verses, he talks about this Mary being the same one who had wiped Jesus' feet with her hair, which always makes you curious. And you're going, but he doesn't record that event. Uh, you have to go elsewhere in the Bible. In fact, in Luke chapter uh, 7, verse 37, it tells us that a woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house so she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. If you recall the story, she broke that jar of perfume and poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the aroma of that, it said, filled the place. And that was, of course, also the time when some of Jesus' disciples said, what a waste of money. That, 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 that perfume could have been sold. It was worth a lot of money. It was an investment. An alabaster jar of perfume like that was something that people bought in order to sell it later on or to use at their own funerals. It was very valuable. Um, but Jesus said, you know, hey, the poor are going to always be with us, but I'm not always going to be here. She anointed me for my death. And there he was teaching his disciples to understand events going on around them from a spiritual perspective and not simply from our own human's perspective. And I believe the same thing is is coming uh, into this as he receives the news. And what is the news? Well, Lazarus is sick. Come. All right? So he's given the invitation. Now, where is Jesus, by the way? You remember the end of chapter 10? In chapter 10, where he was talking about being the good shepherd, he was in Jerusalem. He was talking to the spiritual leaders at the time until he got to where he said, I and the Father are one. Then they wanted to stone him, and the Bible says he slipped away. Well, he went back away from Jerusalem, across the Jordan River, into the area where John the Baptist had worked for a long time baptizing people. So he was away from the city. He was away from the control of the religious leadership in Jerusalem and was there in more of a wilderness area. I think ministering, because it tells us that many people there believed because of his, his ministry there, but also having an opportunity to recoup and to recharge his batteries and to discuss things with his disciples. 
And so it's in the context of that that he gets this message. So he wouldn't have been a huge distance away, but he would have been far enough away it would have taken him some time to get to where Lazarus was. But it is an interesting uh, kind of thing that Jesus' response is, is a little unexpected. Um, because it says when Jesus heard this, he said, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. He's, he's recounting a theme that, that flows through the Gospel of John, that everything that was done in his life was to bring glory to God. In fact, in John chapter 9, which we looked at not that long ago with the man born blind, the same kind of a, a, a message was given when his disciples noticed the blind man or had their attention drawn to the blind man, and their, their question was, who sinned, this guy or his parents? And at that point in John chapter 9 and verse 3, neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Uh, one of the things we have to realize when we get news of a crisis or a trauma to understand why it's happening. We want to know why, don't we? And we often think we can figure it out if we put our mind to it enough and what I think Jesus wanted his followers to get was crises happen because God can bring glory to himself through it. Period. That sounds kind of, kind of, kind of bad to us because we are all about ourselves. But God's saying, no, I'm working. I'm achieving something. My glory is what's at stake. Trust me in this. And so then it moves on to the reaction that he had. And I found that fascinating as well because in verse 5 it tells us that Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Yet when he heard, or so when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed there two more days. I watched a, a short hour long kind of documentary last night on the Holocaust from the point of view of survivors that were telling their story. And one couple was talking, and she was said, well, you know, I still, I still believe in God, but he's having a problem with it. And the old guy was, he's like, I have questions. I have questions about whether God exists. Why would he let these things happen? See, that's always our dilemma, isn't it? Why is God allowing this to happen? And sometimes it hits us like, why is he throwing this delay in the situation? You know, for Martha... And Mary and Lazarus, this sickness was something they saw Jesus could come, take care of it right away. They had a lot of faith. They had a lot of faith in Jesus' power to heal. And Jesus waited because he loved them. Ah, that rubs me wrong. It does. I don't like trouble to continue and someone to say, it's not being resolved because God loves you. Because I figure if God loved me, he'd take care of it, right? See, that's the way our thinking is. Because our minds can't comprehend the love of God and the supernatural nature of the depth of his love for us so that he is not as concerned about our individual circumstances as he is the end result, which will bring way more glory to him and it will actually benefit us the most. And so, in, in spite of the fact that he loved them, it tells us that he waited for two days, and then he announced his return. You know? Okay, let's go back to Judea. And then his disciples are like, why do you want to go back there? Didn't they just try to stone you? They, they don't understand at all how Jesus' thinking works. They don't really understand what he's thinking about. And so he gives them an explanation for his return, for his return to Judea. And he says, because Lazarus is sleeping and I'm going to go wake him up. It was very simple to Jesus. He had waited this amount of time. He wanted God to be glorified. He had a plan. The disciples misunderstood his plan because they say, hey, if he's sleeping, let him sleep. You know, it's kind of like when your kids are sick, isn't it? Hey, they finally slept through the night. Wow, it's great. Let them sleep. Why would you want to wake up somebody that's sleeping? So once again, Jesus does what he always does in verses 12 through 16, demonstrating his, his commitment to them and their commitment to him. He takes that un misunderstanding they had and he tells them plainly, Lazarus is dead. 
I don't think they got it yet. They're still, they're still like us. They're still trying to sort through all this. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Jesus doesn't act like, you know, someone's just died. We don't necessarily want to get involved with uh, uh, trying to understand it any further. But, but he says, Lazarus is dead. I'm, I'm gonna, we're going to go there. And the disciples again are saying, but if we go back to Judea, what's at risk? If Lazarus is already dead, why would we go back when you are risking your own life? What, what's the deal? And Thomas, who gets a lot of bad press in Christian circles, doubting Thomas, that's his, everywhere but in the Bible he's called doubting Thomas, okay? In my mind, loyal Thomas is the word you need to use. Mr. Loyalty himself. The few times that he's described, they call him Doubting Thomas partly too because later on when Jesus was resurrected, he said, hey, unless I see him, because he was so loyal to Jesus. He said, hey, you're not going to get my hopes up if I don't see this guy who I care so deeply about. So loyal Thomas responds with, hey, he wants to go back to Judea. Let's go back to Judea, and if we need to, we'll die with him. That's how loyal he was. This guy was willing to give his life for Jesus. That's the kind of person. And I know that John wouldn't have included that little detail if it wasn't significantly important for us to understand how crises can be managed by those maybe not directly affected by it, but that might get sucked in to realize we can trust God even if it kills us. That's really important stuff to remember because we, like be, we don't like to be disturbed in our comfort. We, we want our life to maintain structure and, and certainty. And sometimes Jesus asks us as his followers to simply follow him. Don't try to understand it all. He'll reveal it to you. But trust him and respond to what he asks. Then in verses 17 through 37, we have the section that I call the demands. The demands of the crisis. And I saw this broken down into three really individuals, Mary, Martha. Actually, it was Martha, then Mary, and then the other people that were surrounding him. All put demands on Jesus in that situation because whenever you face a crisis, there's other people involved, isn't there? There's spouses, there's co-workers, there's fellow students, fellow workers, other relatives that might want to get involved with your crisis. They don't really want to get involved with your crisis, but we have that desire to help, don't we? And, and we want to give some input, and we want to maybe clarify the situation. And so there's demands of the crisis, starting with Martha in verse 17, where it tells us uh, in, in uh, Matthew, or in, <laughs> sorry, in John 11, 17, that on his arrival, uh, Jesus had found that, that Lazarus had been dead in a tomb for four days. Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of her brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. So as Jesus arrives four days later, uh, after his death, probably two days travel from when he waited two days, and then they left, probably took him another two days to get there. Uh, Lazarus had been dead, and there are lots of people around, and Martha hears that Jesus is coming. She runs out to meet him, okay? Mary stays home. Uh, can I just suggest something, too? We'll get into it a little more, but Martha gets a bad rap in the Bible in church circles sometimes, too. You ever notice that? I'm a Mary. I'm not a Martha. Well, who's the first one to run and go see Jesus when he gets there? Martha. And she takes the effort to leave home to go find him as he's approaching, even though there are lots of people around. And what does she say? Lord, if you had been here, he wouldn't have died. You see how much faith they had in Jesus? Lord, if you had have been here, he wouldn't have died. But at the same time she's saying it, it's a demand. It's a demand for God to work the way we want him to work. If you'd have done this, God, it wouldn't have happened. Or if you hadn't have done this, this wouldn't have happened. It's kind of a, it's kind of a sideways criticism of Jesus. In other words, you should have gotten here quicker. You should have gotten here quicker. 
Lord of the universe, master of all creation. You should have gotten here quicker. The audacity, right? Man, how many times have we done that? How many times have we said that to ourselves? Why didn't God do this? He could have. Why didn't he do that? Jesus, in response to her, gives another one of his statements in verse 23, your brother will rise again. And Martha answers, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. You see, Martha was a good religious Jew who understood the teaching of the Pharisees that talked about the resurrection being the hope for the future. And she said, I understand that, Jesus. I understand that. I wish you'd have gotten here quicker, but I understand he'll rise in the last day. And then Jesus says to her, on top of being, you know, we already mentioned the word, the bread, the water, the light, etc. I, and I love it. He will rise again in the resurrection. Jesus says, I'm the resurrection. Boom. I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. And then he says, do you believe this? One of the commentators I read said that Jesus' reply, he turned Mar Martha's acceptance of a dogma, a teaching of their religious system in the resurrection of the dead, he wanted to turn her acceptance of that dogma into faith in his person. To have more faith in the person of Jesus than she had in simply a statement from their doctrinal statement. We believe this, we believe this, we believe this. He says, do you believe it? Do you believe I'm the resurrection and the life? And she says, yes. Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Okay? To me, that's a huge statement, but it's also a guarded statement. She's not sure exactly what she believes about Jesus in the context of her crisis. Because it sounds like he's challenging her to believe that she doesn't need to worry about Lazarus being dead because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. He asks her if she believes that. She says, well, I believe you're the, the Christ, the Son of God who has come into the world. She didn't know the details. You're the Messiah. That's what I believe. Whatever the Messiah can do, you can do. I believe that. But she doesn't really know because she's like me. Is God the God of miracles? Yeah, I believe that, kind of. Because I've seen a lot of bad situations go without having a miracle. That's the bottom line. Prayed and prayed and trusted God for miracles and saw miracles not happen. The beloved person that loves the Lord that you pray for and pray for and they pass away anyhow. And you begin to say, okay, I believe you're the God of the universe that can do anything. But mm. you see, we have a hard time really just putting our faith in God and saying, yeah, I believe you are the resurrection and Really, regardless of the outcome, we should have a positive perspective on the crises we face because we know that Jesus Christ has that power. But the next person we see in that passage, and there's not as nearly as much time spent on, is his interaction with Mary. Because now Martha goes back, and it's, I think Martha's point of view is, Mary, where are you? Jesus is coming into town, and I think he wants to talk to you. Now, I, there's no record there that said, go tell Mary to come. Um, but that was Martha's take on it. Maybe she didn't like his answer. Maybe she liked his answer a lot and was a little afraid to believe it. So she needs some support from her sister, you know, Mary. He, he wants to, so Mary leaves, and of course, uh, everybody else that, that was there follows her because they want to see what in the world Mary's doing, leaving the house because she's supposed to be putting on this wake and everything. Um, but it's interesting, Mary's statement, one statement to Jesus. What did she say that was different than Martha? Nothing. 
exact same thing. If you had have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. So I think they coached each other or something ahead of time. What are we going to say if Jesus comes? I think we ought to say if he'd have been here, he wouldn't have died. I don't know. I, it sounds like coaching to me. That's the only statement she makes in her coming to Jesus, except she falls at his feet. She acknowledges him as Lord, but she also realizes that if he'd have been there, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now, the response of Jesus in this passage is completely different. Instead of prompting her in her area of faith, Jesus is full of empathy. One of the greatest qualities a person can have is the ability to empathize with others. Do you know what empathy is? It's not sympathy. Empathy means you begin to place yourself in the position of the other so you can understand what they're thinking and feeling. It has to do more with an analysis of the situation. And Jesus had such empathy for Mary's situation, it says that he was deeply moved and he was troubled. And I think those two words being put together uh, remind us that, that Jesus emotionally felt what the people around him were going through. He cared about what the people around him were going through. Jesus cares about what's going on in your life, whether you realize it or not. He understands it better than you do yourself, and he actually cares. He actually is empathetic with you. He, he wants to understand how that feeling can be changed. And so he asked where they've laid him. They take him to, to Lazarus' tomb and, and that short Bible verse that every kid that has to learn Bible verses wants to learn first. Jesus wept. They all know that verse. I know that verse from the Bible. Jesus wept. Um, but it's profound. The tears of God. The tears of God. What brings God to tears? Was it the sight of the tomb where Lazarus was laid? Was it the sight of all the other people mourning and wailing and, and, and the sense of abandonment that, that the sisters may have expressed to him, his dear, dear friends? Was it the sudden realization, because Jesus was totally human as well, that one of his best friends is gone? Suddenly that, 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 that terrible thing that, that comes because of sin that's called death, which is separation, struck him. Just because he's the son of God doesn't mean he doesn't feel what we feel. He understands it. One other place in the Bible where it tells us that Jesus cried, and that was in Luke chapter 19, after the, the triumphal entry, all right, comes over a hill and sees Jerusalem. It tells us in Luke 19, 41, as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. You see, Jesus knows our lack of faith. He knows the problem we have living the kind of life we're supposed to in response to us acknowledging him as the Messiah, and he feels for us. He cries. I don't think it always sinks into me that there are times when, when God cries for me. I just feel so, he feels so bad because I don't get it. You almost got to, if you've got children, you got to almost put it in that context. How, would you, how do you feel when your children are messing up royally or have really missed the boat? And you just, it breaks your heart. It just breaks your heart. God feels that way toward you and I in the midst of a crisis. It brings him to tears. It's not, he's not mad at you because of your lack of faith. He's not upset with you that you haven't figured it out yet. When are they ever going to learn? He's sad. He wants you to grow in him so that when the crises come, you deal with it, be, not because you're so strong, but because Jesus Christ is there with you. And he says, I'm the resurrection and the life. I'm the one who transcends physical life. And then it tells us about the others involved with the demands. In verse, it was verse 31 mentions them, and then verses 36 through 37, it just talks about the people around him looking. And when the Jews 
when the Jews said, see how he loved him, but some, then the Jews said that, but some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind have kept this man from dying? Do you see how they're putting a little bit of demands on Jesus' actions too as well? Look at his love, but why didn't he do something? You know, what good is tears when you've got the ability to solve the problem? And often in our time of crisis, we have to remind ourselves that Jesus and God's timing is not our timing, that he is accomplishing something that can bring glory to God in that situation. So timing is of the essence. And trust me, I know how it feels when you're in a crisis, when fall, things just fall completely apart and you don't know what good could possibly come of it. It just breaks you up. It devastates you. And there's Jesus crying right along with everybody else. And then verses 38 through 44, of course, give us the deliverance in the crisis or the deliverance from the crisis. He's looking at the tomb, right? Verse 38. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. The usual form of a tomb wasn't anything unusual about it. What was unusual about this whole situation was not the form of the tomb that Jesus was looking at, but the request he made to the person who was in charge of keeping the tomb, where he said, roll the stone away. Because oftentimes to experience deliverance, we have to understand that Jesus is fully aware of our situation and his request to us might be something that we think is totally out of the blue. Where did that come from? I'm all wrapped up in my own hurt and concern and care and you want me to call somebody else? Or I'm all worried about my own finances, God, and you're saying, give me what you got, give me your money, give it to so-and-so. We go, whoa, whoa, whoa. In essence, we say, like they told him there at the tomb, that idea stinks. That's a bad idea. Jesus, your request is a bad idea. Uh, that was Martha. She's the practical one, but she has practical faith. By, the time that, by this time, there's a bad order for he's been there for four days. Jesus understood natural laws were at work. In fact, Jesus understood natural laws were at work, which was the reason why he waited as long as he did to overcome any superstitions they might have that the spirit of Lazarus was still somehow hovering around, because that was kind of in Jewish tradition too, that the spirit of a dead person would hover around for about three days or two days. Jesus waited for four days. Why? Because then none of you guys are going to say, oh, the spirit, he just brought the spirit back. No, he is dead and gone, and he is starting to rot. That's a horrible picture. But those were days when things were a lot simpler, a lot more practical, a lot more cut and dry. So when he approaches the tomb and says, roll the stone away, that is not a common request. Okay? They did not do that. But it tells us that they did. Did not I tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God. Remember him saying that to Martha? Didn't I tell you that? Okay. Now she's going to try to understand how this takes place. And so it tells us that they took away the stone in verse 41. And Jesus looked up and prayed. And that's his prayer portion in those verses. Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. Jesus was doing so much more than simply raising Lazarus from the dead. This was a statement event. This was not the same as him raising that boy who had died, okay, that was on the way to the cemetery, he raised his son back to life because it was the son of a widow or something, and, and Jesus did it in his own way and moved on. It wasn't the same as Jairus' daughter, where he went in, closed the door, told her to get up, and presented her to the family, kind of like the Old Testament prophets. This was a big deal in Jesus' proclamation 
of how God would be glorified in him. And it's interesting to, to rethink the life of Jesus and, and know when it is that God would be glorified in Jesus. If you go later, and we'll see it in the book of John, where Jesus begins to prayer and he says, Father, now glorify your son. When does he say that? At the point of his crucifixion. This miracle is a foundational sign the culmination, you might say, of the proofs of his deity to an unbelieving people, including the Jews, the religious leaders that were there, but also his followers, because his disciples are watching all this too. They're trying to get a grip on this. What's Jesus mean? I'm the resurrection and the life. He didn't say it to them. He said it to Martha, but they heard it. They're trying to access that. We need to try to access that. And realized Jesus' prayer was offered so the people around him would understand this is something God is doing. It's for the benefit of, the, of these bystanders. And their faith is the desired outcome. He says, I'm praying this so that their faith will be strong. Not so that Lazarus will come back to life. It's almost like that's a minor detail. In the whole event, I want to encourage their faith. See, that's how we need to learn to read the Bible. We need to learn to read our circumstances that way. Why? So that our faith will grow as a result of going through that experience, not simply to acquire knowledge about what God can do, but realize that faith is the desired outcome. And so he com makes a command in verses, the last two verses, 43 and 44. When he had said this, Jesus cried out in a loud voice. I love that, loud voice. It's... It, it resonates in the book of Revelation because when Jesus Christ comes in judgment, there's loud sounds, aren't there? And he says something with a loud voice. Now he says it with a loud voice. Kind of took me back, John chapter 5, where Jesus was talking to people. And he said, don't be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. And even before that, he said, there is a time coming, and now is when those in, her, in his graves will hear a vo his voice. So Jesus is making a point of following through with his disciples who have heard his previous statements, even if the bystanders hadn't. He prays to his heavenly Father for the sake of the bystanders, including the Jews, who need proof that he's God's son. I want, God, I want them to know that God sent me. But now... I'm going to say with a loud voice so people remember some of the things that I said, what's going to happen? This is the loud voice of the Messiah speaking. And what's the first thing he says? Lazarus. Because every dead body would have heard him if he hadn't picked out the right name, if he wanted him to. See, now he's beginning to help people understand what the difference from the loud voice here is from the loud voice spoken about in Revelation where the dead in Christ will rise because he won't call our name. He will simply go, get up. And so Jesus said with a loud voice, Lazarus, Lazarus, come out. And that idea coming out had to do with with uh, someone who had been in prison being, being released, being unrestricted. You go from your point of restriction, it's like walking out of jail. He, he, he's saying in a way, Lazarus, come on. You know, the door's open, come out. And everybody, this is a guy who's been dead for four days. They have come to grips with the reality of his death. And what happens? The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. What was the responsibility of the bystanders in this account? They had to roll the stone away, right? They had to listen to what Jesus was saying. And then when Jesus worked his deliverance in the life of Lazarus, what was their job? To unbind him. Remove the barriers. 
One of the greatest truths God's church needs to learn is that God is breathing his life into dead individuals all the time, and our job is to set, cooperate with God and unbind them. Don't put obstacles in front of people who are coming to life through Jesus Christ. We do that. In essence, they rise from the dead spiritually, and we wrap them up. Now you got to do this. Now you got to do this. Now you got to do this. Instead of saying, let's get rid of those grave clothes. Let's get rid of those false expectations. Let's get rid of the meaningless rules that people would pile on you as you begin your life with Christ and let Jesus Christ give you a life that never ends. We want you to see it all. He had a cloth over his face. We want you to feel it all. His hands and his feet were bound up. We want you to move about freely because God's got a work he wants to do in your lives. We have a responsibility, and that's really my conclusion, is that you and I can see Jesus bring life to other people. We can see that happen. He's the one that brings life. He's the one that initiates life in them. He's the one that gives them life everlasting. But we can cooperate with God. That's a great truth. By removing obstacles so other people can live the life that God intends for them to live. So that's where we need to focus our attention as followers of Jesus. Do you have eternal life? That's good. A lot of other people being touched by God regularly, waiting for a little human involvement so that they can see, so that they can move, so that they can feel the spirit of truth in them. What, what's your part? I think we all need to cooperate with God more as a church and as individuals. Let's pray. Lord, as we have ended our time and as we have looked at this portion of your word and reminded ourselves again of the fact that you are the, the, the very God that brings life into people's lives and you are the God that opens blind eyes. You're the God that, that is like water to a, to a thirsty person. You are the bread of life. You're the resurrection. You are the life. Father, help us not to forget that but to remind ourselves daily of finding faith in each crisis. In Jesus' name, amen.